Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Bethany Church. So glad you're here today. My name is Jeff Jennings, and I serve here as pastor at Bethany Church, Doris's home church for many years. And it was a privilege of mine to get to know her over the years and have her in my uh, small group here at the church as, as well for the past few years. And I told the family, too, I watched a Blazer game at her house, so I'm practically family. <laughs> um, so we're, you're in good company today if you're a Blazer fan. Um, today, what we're going to do are a few things. We're going to have some time to sing together some of Doris's favorite hymns, to hear from some family members, to share some of our own uh, memories, and to see what true love is in Jesus Christ. That's kind of going to be our, our theme today, love. Um, so on behalf of the Robertson family, uh, Wade and Gail and Kirk and the extended uh, family, uh, we welcome you here today. Doris loved Jesus, and Doris lived her life for Jesus. And I know you're here today because you loved Doris. Doris knew that love is defined by Jesus and that only true love comes through Jesus. And the permanence of real love comes from Christ. Love that's not based on a transaction or love based on what I can do for you, but love based even not on the loveliness of the one being loved, but based on the character and heart of the one doing the loving. That's Jesus. I think and believe that each and every one of us, as we talk through this theme today of love, and a bit later in the service some more, that all of us really want to be known and seen by someone who, when they truly see us, as we are, they keep loving us. They don't abandon us. They don't walk away, but maybe even more so commit to stick with us. Today, we're going to focus on love. So keep that theme in mind today, even during our sharing time. Maybe it's something you loved about Doris you want to share um, or something, a loving memory you have of her, the love of Jesus, the love Doris had for Jesus and the love he has for her. So let's go ahead and pray to open today. Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And today, as we celebrate the life of Doris and her memories and relationships and ways she served you, we know these things for her were driven by the love you have for her and by the love she had for you and still does. We ask today that we would experience your love and care through the bond of this fellowship and gathering today, through the prayers of your people, the songs we sing and the memories we share of our friend and sister in Christ, mother, grandmother, Doris. So give wisdom and comfort today to the Robertson and extended family, and let us find hope today in the words of our Savior who said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. There is real hope today for us. We know because Doris believes in you. We know she is with you. We know her resurrection and ours too is coming someday. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, we'll hear later, I, I see, we see now in a mirror dimly but someday we will see you face to face, Jesus. Now we know in part, but then, Paul writes, I shall know fully, even as I've been fully known, we've been fully known by you. Doris doesn't see in a dim mirror today, but face to face, and for that we are eternally grateful. So help us to today to get a clear glimpse of you, Jesus. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, as I said, we are going to sing a couple of um, Doris's favorite hymns, and the first one is going to be How Great Thou Art, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. The other one is Amazing Grace. So I'm going to have us go ahead and stand and uh, sing these songs. You'll see the words behind me, but join together, whether you know these songs or not, because Doris loved these songs.
Bev Gorbett's going to come read from Psalm 23 for us. I'm sure that for many of you, as for me, and especially for Doris, this was a very special psalm. And while Doris was in the hospital, she had the experience of living, walking through the valley of the shadow of death and knowing that her Savior was with her. And the reality of Doris's life that comes at the end of this, that she is now dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. Hmm. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
Hello. I'm Gail. I'm Doris's daughter. We'll see how I can get through this. Doris Alethea Robertson flew away on Sunday, March 24th, 2024, after she watched the Sunday service live streamed from Bethany, smiling her last smile as the children made their noisy exits to Sunday school. She was surrounded by her children, her grandchild, and all of the love she held in her life. Doris Doe, Mrs. Robertson, Grandma Doe, Mom, was born on May 28, 1938 in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and raised with her older brother, Pinky, Roy. From a young age, Doris loved to sing. All of her life, she sang constantly without regard for key or tune, <laughs> much to the embarrassment of her children. <laughs> when she was in grade school, her class was chosen to sing on the radio. The director pulled little Doris aside and instructed her to just mouth the words <laughs> for a radio show. In high school, she was a solid student and a cheerleader, but she would say her best day was when she was 16, in an act of rebellion, she went to church, and she never stopped. Doris was a member of Bethany for about six decades. She started her long career in education as a Greenville scholar and spent most of 40 plus years in Canby elementary schools, particularly Eccles, where she taught second grade for many years. I do not have a tissue. <laughs> Pass it to me. Um, excuse me. She was a skilled negotiator, helping to bring the union to Canby District 86 and serving over the years at, the, um, at every level in the union, finding her passion and going to bat for fellow teachers. After retirement, she was famous for Read Across America, where she gathered volunteers to read to children and give away books, dressed as the cat in the hat. She was an amazing teacher. Her classroom was creative, colorful, and organized, and my refuge. The bulletin board spilled with art, and she had a drawer in her desk filled with stickers. She told me often that she became a teacher because she wanted all of the gold stars. <laughs> she was equally an amazing mom, cooking us full breakfast early in the morning before school because she was never late. She offered us love and guidance all through our lives. She stayed present, being there to build the memories that will help us now when we so much need it. Doris was a good friend. Her friendships ran deep and provided her so much support and joy all through her life. All of her travels, luncheons, gatherings, and beach trips she and her friends spent together were always filled with raucous laughter. The Blazer Games, Christmas Champagne Gatherings, the Hula Pie at Dukes, the Friday lunches, all of those times meant so much to her. A few years after retiring in 1999, Doris used her negotiating skills to place foreign exchange students in local homes and school districts. This opened the door to the whole world for her. She hosted students from all over the globe and traveled with the agencies she worked for. She designed programs, organized tours, and made friends on every continent. She volunteered with the Canby Kiwanis and enjoyed working in the thrift store, but especially the Kitty Caper Parade before the Clackamas County Fair. She was even Grand Marshal one year, dressed in her famous cat in the hat costume. She is deeply mourned and missed by her three children, Wade, Gail, Nathan, and Kirk, Anna, Wade's sons, Christopher and Caleb, granddaughter, an apple of her eye, Camry Rose, great-granddaughter, Kinsley, her beloved nieces, Cynthia, Kathy, and Charlene, and her ex-husband and longtime friend, Kelly. She is also mourned by her many cherished friends and her students from Canby all over the world and everywhere. She was preceded to heaven's open door by her father, Hans Melvin Anderson, 
her mother, Esther Amanda Anderson, her brother, Pinky Roy. We never called him Roy. <laughs> her niece, Carla, and her oldest friend, Darlene, who, I have been told, was standing at that open doorway that Sunday with two steaming hot cups of coffee and a whole bunch of news she just couldn't wait to spill. <laughs> to celebrate Doris, sing. Sing loud. Go ahead, embarrass your children. Sing as if Jesus himself were the only one listening. Do not take any advice that tells you to just mouth the words. Sing with the voice God gave you.
special to see a life across photos like that. And I'm sure that jarred some memories for you, and I felt like the one with her glasses down like we were her students, and she was looking at us like, <laughs> kind of telling us to get in shape. Well, hopefully that jarred some of your own memories and thoughts about Doris as we continue our theme of love today. Doris's love of learning and reading and getting books into kids' hands and, and music, even if she didn't felt, think she had the best of voice. I heard, she told that to me like five times. She would always say that. And I said, just sing. Just sing, Doris. Nobody's listening. Nobody cares. Just sing. Um, and so thanks for singing out on our songs today. But we get to use our voices as well to share some stories. Um, here's what we're going to do. We've got about a 10, 15-minute window for some of us in this room to share something we love about Doris a memory that we love, that we had with Doris, uh, an encouraging uh, thought for the family in light of Doris's memory and your time with her. But uh, we do have a limited time. And so as we do this, my encouragement to you is, although there's many things you could share and tons of stories and maybe long stories you could share, don't do that now. <laughs> Save that for the gathering place afterwards out there. There'll be plenty of time to share more and, and grab one of the family members and, and share. But, and, and we want to make space for as many as possible in this window we have to share. I think we've got a couple guys that are going to come up and gr- have some mics. Um, we've got Lee and Jack here. They're gonna, Lee's going to take this side. Jack's going to take over here. And uh, uh, this is a time, as I said, for you to share just some thoughts uh, to encourage the family to honor Doris's life and her memory. So, uh, and as you do speak, keep the mic right by your chin, and, and if, if you could, if you're able, stand so everybody can see you. Anybody want to get us started? My name is uh, Wade Robertson. I'm the oldest son. Um, For those that do know me, you know that I like to be the center of attention, but today isn't one of those days. Hmm. She was 85, and I feel like she went way too soon. There was stories and all kinds of things I still wanted to ask her I never got to. Um, She loved being a teacher. She loved being a mom. She loved God. She loved her friends, but God always came first. She loved her uh, foreign exchange students like they were her own kids and her students. I remember she would cook cookies for her kids at school, and the only ones we got were the burnt ones. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh. She, she was active in the community, like my sister was saying, Kiwanis, exchange students. Um, before she went, we did have a, a conversation. Just, I did ask her, I go, well, if, when you go to heaven, who do you think the first person that you're going to see? And she shrugged her shoulders, and I kind of gave her a look. I go, well, how, how about if it's Darlene? And she's standing there, and she has a coffee in one hand, a rogue's dog in the other, and she's saying, welcome home, Doris. And actually, she gave me a smile, which was one of the few ones that I saw her have. Um, It's not going to be the same without her. I mean, Christmases, birthdays, they just won't be the same, really. I mean, she lit my candles for 61 years. (laughs) Got me a stocking. (laughs) I'm going to miss that. You don't realize that you're going to miss it until it's gone. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm going to miss her a lot. And uh, she'll always be with me. And I'll always try to do the right thing. And I can thank my mom for that one. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Wade. Okay. I want to like to think for me being able to know her, she was a great Kwanian, and she's always out helping the kids. Oh, I'm 
I'm Sandy Poole. <laughs> and uh, she and I were such dear friends for so many years. Uh, in fact, when I woke up this morning, I thought, oh, it's her memorial. And uh, how am I going to get there? Let's see. Maybe I'll, I'll give Doris a call and see if she can stop by. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, wait a minute. No, I can't do that. My daughter's coming. <laughs> I'm just going to miss that dear lady so much. I can't tell you. Uh, there's a hole in my heart. But she's with our Lord Jesus. And she's just having the time of her life. I know she is. So I have to keep that picture in my mind because, you know, she and I were the same age, uh, except uh, our birthdays were just that far apart. So we were the same age for maybe five days. <laughs> so, you know, my time's coming up, and I'm hoping she's going to be there at the door with Darlene with a cup of coffee. That'd be pretty nice. <laughs> sure love that lady. My name is Mariah Leighton, and um, I do remember that we used to go over there every Christmas Eve, and and we used to um, perform plays that we made up, and so it was pretty cool. It was there were plays that no one knew. I mean, we we, we just made them up. So it was, but it was fun because we got to to be be with our friends, and um, I will miss her. We'll go over here to Jack, and then we'll come over here second. My name is Angela Christensen Baker. Um, so I have two versions of Doris in my mind always. My father was a teacher in town. My mother worked at Eccles for several years with Doris as well. And so I have a vision of her as a child and um, being in the school, but uh, more so as um, I'm a Kwanian and has been a president of Kwanians for the last several years. Um, I have gotten to know Doris more as an adult now. And one of the biggest things for me is she would comment on my Facebook page all the time, and I couldn't understand what she was typing because her typos. And I kept rolling my eyes going, what is going on? But I began to look forward to it, going, what is she going to comment next on watching my kids grow, giving me encouragement? And it just became a game after that of what is she saying? What is she? Because it was always the best um, encouragement of, of whatever I was posting. So I'm going to miss, I think, that the most. Hello, my name is uh, Barry Zahner, and I was a 1970s student of Mr. Robertson. And the thing I remember most is I got passed around between teachers in the first grade. Nobody, nobody wanted me. I had several of them. But uh, when it came to second grade, Mrs. Robertson actually requested me. Don't know why or how, but <laughs> my mom was a school teacher at 91, and they were kind of, we were friends and neighbors with the family. They were across the street from us. I got to know Wade. Hey, Wade. Kirk and Gail and Kelly. I uh, love you guys. Miss you guys. It was, we had great, oh, man, it was crazy back then. It's back in the 70s. But... Uh, I thought it, when I heard she passed away, I just like, favorite teacher had to come. Mm -hmm. Just no other way. And you guys are very lucky to have known her. Mm -hmm. I wish I had known her for as, kept in touch more. I'd, I'd drive by the house every once in a while, wave at her, and we'd say hi. But mm -hmm. I moved away and then came back. And, but you guys are uh, very lucky, the family. She was a loving person, and I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. That's a sweet story. Maybe some others. We have uh, Nancy here. Lee will come to you, I think. Hi, my name is Nancy Clark. This is not my comfort zone, let me tell you. <laughs> but when I think of Doris, I think of people that walk into your life and make an impression. Doris made an imprint in your heart. And whatever you got from her, take it out and spread it. 
she had the love of the Lord, and she was just one of those that just made an impression on me for sure. We're going to miss her. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm Chris's daughter. And I grew up my entire life knowing Doris. There's not a moment that she hasn't been in our lives. And I just want to say that she is a radical lady. And she led the way for a lot of us. She gave me one of my first tax paying jobs. I didn't really know what the taxes were, so I didn't know why I was being robbed the first time, but she explained it. Um, but she had an amazing network of friends, and she created friends wherever she went. And I would hang out with any of them, <laughs> because you are all so amazing. And she had that influence with all of you. So I just want her to be known as being a righteous and radical lady who had couth and kept people in line. <laughs> Doris was a very special friend to me. And um, the group of us usually went out to lunch after church. And we had such a good time doing that. And I'll always have fond memories of that. Doris was my best friend for 55 years, and the way I met her was Wade came over and was running on top of my husband's new car. <laughs> and so she busted. Two, a couple days later, she invited us to her house. And our second son broke Wade's all of his presents that he got for his birthday. <laughs> So we became best friends after that. <laughs> I'm guessing Wade wasn't the best friend after that. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for sharing that. There's some more? Okay. Uh, Lee, we have some right here. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Charlene, and I'm here with my sister Kathy from Texas. And Doris uh, was our aunt, and uh, I didn't know her growing up because um, our mom was married to her brother, and they got divorced when, when we were little. But as an adult, we all got to reconnect, and uh, that was by Doris's doing. And uh, my sister Kathy, thank you for doing that. Um, and it's, she was a wonderful lady. And I'm thankful that I got to know her and the kids. And um, I love every one of you so much. And I know how much you're going to miss your mom. Um, um, she was definitely a lady worth knowing. And uh, I loved her very much. Thank you all for coming today. A couple more, maybe? Gordy Pearson, and um, one of the things that I remember dearly about Doris is that she loved kids, not only her own kids and her kids in school, but kids in church. And um, one of the cool things about Doris was that she and Darlene were one of the last people that got to be with my sister, Carol, mm. at that uh, beach trip in 1971. And uh, that's always been a special memory to me that, uh, that they were with her last mm. and uh, cared, for, cared for her. And uh, she was an amazing woman and uh, valued her memory. Thanks, Gordy. We have one more. Gail, you can, yes, you can speak twice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Speak <laughs> yeah. Well, it wouldn't be Doris's memorial if you didn't learn something today. So I wanted to teach you a thing to do with your loved ones. When you hold their hands, squeeze three times. It means I love you. Mm. Squeeze back twice, how much? And then squeeze it for all it's worth until bones break. Mm. <laughs> so that's what you do. Please do that in memory of Doris. 
You want to stay here? You're reading scripture oh, next. I'm reading scripture next. Okay. <laughs> Gail's going to read to us from 1 Corinthians 13. I don't think so. Okay. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith... So as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. For tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a woman, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now. Faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Thanks, Gail. Maybe you still had something you want to share, and I want to encourage you after today, um, if you had a memory or something you want to um, talk to the family about, please find them out there or share it with somebody out there. We honor the Lord. We honor Doris' life when we share those stories. I want to take just a few moments, as our theme has been love, to talk about um, love for a few moments. I want to talk about the necessity of love. It's necessary for life. I want to talk about the beautiful impossibility of love. Although it's so beautiful, sometimes it just seems elusive. And then I want to talk about the permanence of love that we all want, every heart in this room, and where to find it. You heard that passage that Gail read. It's a famous passage, um, most uh, prominently read at at weddings, but sometimes at memorials and funerals as well. Uh, And it was a passage the family wanted to hear as we met a few weeks back and talked about Doris's service. And it contains some of the most beautiful uh, images and descriptions of love, that it never ends that it can endure anything. But almost as we might have familiarity with this passage, we have just as much familiarity with the ideals of love and how quickly they can disappear too. That elusiveness of it, the beautiful impossibility of it. Or we think about our life, how often we do not respond lovingly to those in our lives. So I want to explore just for a few moments a few of these verses uh, in, in, from 1 Corinthians 13 to talk about that. The necessity of love, the way it's beautifully impossible, and then the permanence of it and where to find it. As you read in 1 Corinthians 13, written by the Apostle Paul, Paul says the beginning of these verses as we start with the necessity of love. He says, you know, you can say a lot of things. You can know a lot of things, and you can do a lot of things. This is my summary of Paul. But if you don't have love in it, You're like a clanging cymbal, a banging gong that hurts our ears without love. Without love, he writes, these things are nothing. You can can even sacrifice your own life for someone, but if it's not done out of love, it's really a waste. It's nothing. I think he's pointing to the fact as he says, yeah, we do all these things, we say lots of things, but without love, they're like a clanging cymbal or an out-of-tune orchestra. He says, we do these things without love. He's pointing to the fact that love is a necessity of life. 
a necessity of all these things if they're to have meaning and purpose and real eternal value. The love that strikes at the heart of of every human heart, of what it means to actually be human. A lot of you probably have some really loving moments with Doris, and some of you shared some of them today. And you're thinking about those today. And our loving memories, they do stick with us in many ways. And they get stirred up by photos that we see. Because love is an absolute necessary part of life. It's not some additive to life. It's not an app that we open every once in a while and then swipe away from our screen. No, life, love is like the oxygen of life. Paul's saying if you don't have it in any of these things, they're meaningless, they're empty. In fact, maybe even harmful without love. It's the essence of what it means to be human. And Paul's saying here, if you don't have love, this doesn't work. Life doesn't work. Even if you were to give away all you had, even your life, he goes to say, without love, it's, it, it's meaningless. Imagine a scenario uh, with me, if you will. A scenario where there is an incredibly, extravagantly wealthy family who's got an abundance of goods and, and, and stuff and money just pouring out of every part of their life. But imagine this scenario now where this wealthy family was going to give money to an impoverished single mom with kids. She has great need. Her kids maybe don't have a lot of clothes and much things, to, toys to play with, but there's this wealthy family that's got all this money and they come to her and they, uh, or, or to this charity that's going to give to her. They come to the charity and they tell the charity, you know, we will give her money. We will give her more than she ever could possibly need. She'll have everything she ever wanted. But for us to give her the money, she must understand that we do not love her. We do not love her. We do not love her kids. And that we don't want any ongoing relationship out of this. We don't want anything relationally with them. We do not love them at all. And they have to acknowledge this. They understand this. And then we can give them the money. You know, we got to unload some money. We need to get the tax break, right? We want to make us look good in the community. But she has to know no love. Now, pragmatically, you hear that story. We might say, well, take the money and run, right? Take the money and run, mom, for your kids. But deep down, we know Without love, that is meaningless. It's meaningless. You know, she might even say this, Mom, you know what, keep it. I'd rather be broke than to accept your money on your terms. It's possible because we realize the depth and necessity of love for everything we do to have meaning and purpose and value. Paul knows it, and that's what he's saying in these first few verses. Life runs on love. It's necessary. And yet when we go on in this passage, we see that As necessary as it is, it also is a beautiful impossibility at times. Let's talk about that. When Paul begins to describe love after he talks about how necessary it is, we get kind of carried away with what he says. And as Gail read it, you heard some of those descriptors. You're like, wow, listen to all those descriptors. It's so beautiful. But in many ways, when you hear it described so selflessly and, and patient and long-suffering, the way Paul described it, you think it's so beautiful. But in some ways, it's beyond our human experience, the way he's describing it. Love is patient. Love is kind. Here's some of the verses. Doesn't envy, doesn't boast, doesn't insist on its own way doesn't get irritable. How many people got ir- irritable, irritated today? Probably. <laughs> traffic, cones outside, you know, traffic. I mean, we're all a little irritable and can be right now. We're all on edge. <laughs> resentful, doesn't get resentful, that kind of love. Loves the truth, bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things, everything. It's an incredible description of love. And on our best days, we long to give this type of love. And on our worst days, we desperately want to receive that kind of love. To be more patient with our loved ones. To know that when we fail, we're not going to be left by our loved ones. And we catch glimpses of it, don't we? You you catch glimpses of it in your life. You know you do. You have that moment where you're like, oh, that's kind of almost like otherworldly what just happened. You know those little moments. 
It's the birth of a baby, their first smile on their face, the hug they give you, um, seeing a long lost friend as you guys were reunited with Doris. I mean, you get little glimpses of it, don't you, in life. But we know any relationship has quite a bit of those unloving moments as well, so that it almost seems strangely beautiful, but out of reach to us. But here's the, the ironic thing. It's in the beauty of this love that, and its seemingly impossibility that it like draws us back to it over and over again, even sometimes when it disappears from our life. It's like a game. And there is no way to get it right every time, but by playing this game of love, we're like drawn back to it. Doris loved her blazers, didn't she? And if you went over there, you know she liked to watch it loud before she got her hearing aids. She loved to blare the blazers and just watch it and loved the blazers. She loved basketball and especially those blazers. And as I said, we had the privilege of going to her house to watch a game, and some of you went uh, like weekly during the season, I know some of you did, um, to watch those games with her. But the thing about basketball is that a successful three-point shooter hits like three out of ten shots. Think about that. Three out of ten is really successful. The best three-point shooter is three out of ten, maybe a four. You would think that would Turn them running, right? Who likes to be successful three out of ten times? No. And yet the players are like obsessed and they'll practice and they'll go to the gym and they'll analyze their shot on film film to be a three out of ten guy. You know, I I would go for a one out of ten for the Blazers this season, but it didn't happen. (laughs) I would have loved one out of ten threes. Maybe love is like that the primary kind of game of our lives that is, is beautiful. And maybe we airball seven out of 10 times, but man, those three out of 10, so sweet. And we keep going back because of that. The beauty and yet the impossibility of it. But now every now and then we have those, those, those pure glimpses, don't we? Those three or four out of 10 are pretty marvelous. And it drives us and it shapes all we do when we get these beautiful, impossible glimpses of it. And more than anything in the world, I believe this, it is what drives the human heart and the thing we are looking for. Is someone going to love me? I want you to say you love me. And once you know me in all of my unacceptability, I still want you to love me. And then I I want you to say you're going to love me again and again. And then I want you to prove it. And then I want you to say it two more times to me. We all want that, which leads to the final point, the permanence of love. We talked about the necessity of it. We talked about the the beautiful possibility of it, but how about the permanence of it? We all have this nagging sense, and the Apostle Paul's not naive. He's not naive. Love, like everything, is, is, is perishable. It's temporary. It's fleeting. Momentary. And, and for some of us, it takes a memorial service like this to remind us of that and to bring that to reality again. As Doris is gone, she's not here anymore. It's right to grieve the loss of that love. As I know her kids are, and they, as Wade shared, that just that sense of like, like the birthday candles and the stocking, like you said. I mean, that's, that's a reality. And I'm glad you pointed us to the reality of that because it's important. Moments like this remind us that it is very impermanent. As Doris is, we said, gone from the earth, the love she shared with many of you, she takes with her, even though there's things in your heart. Paul's not naive. He knows that when he writes this big passage on love. He says, you know, these things we say, these things we do, our gifts we have, our skills, even our spiritual insights, he's saying at the end of the passage, he says, that that partial, that's going to pass away. I know there's so much of life that's going to pass away, except, and I think Gail paused at this part in verse 8, love never ends. I think you kind of read that like really slow, and I'm glad you did. Love never ends, the passage says. It will not pass away. And Paul knows as he writes this to this church in Corinth that that's really what we want. The permanence of love is what we want. 
The sense of sorrow with Doris being gone points to the very reality and truth of that. We want love to stay, not go. The beauty of seeing a loved one stick with a spouse who's ill. We see the beauty in that, the permanence of sticking there when it's so easy to run away. The beauty of a spouse walking through another spouse with dementia. The beauty of seeing that permanence when it'd be so easy and you know there's temptation and desires and days to say, I wish I could just walk away from this. We know the beauty though of seeing it stick and that love stick and that person stick. Or when the person we are loving has nothing to offer back to us. When all I can shoot is air balls, right? <laughs> or when I get to that place in life, will you, still, will you still love me? When I have nothing to offer you, is our love just transactional? As soon as I stop keeping up my end of the bargain, you're gone? We know there's something wrong with that. We all know the impermanence of love that we won't be able actually to bear all things, we won't be able to endure all things. We won't always be patient in all things. We won't forgive all things. And we recognize the limitations on our love, but we so desperately want it to be permanent, don't you? I know you do. So how do we cope with that? How does the world cope with that? We do. We cope with that because every human heart knows it. We want this permanent love. Well, there's a couple ways. We either get cynical and kind of give up on love, which is really just a phony front, because every heart wants it, even the most tough, hardened man who's, you know, independent and self-sufficient, it's still, at the end of the day, a front. So we either get cynical, and we give up on love, or maybe knowing it's impossible, we redefine love, as is pretty common in our day, lowering this rich definition you heard Gail read, lowering the definition of love, maybe just down to a feeling, it is that. It's not less than that, but it's a lot more than that. I don't want us to give up on the vision Paul had for it. I don't want you to give up on that vision Paul had for love. What I want us to do is that you and I as humans have made one fatal error when it comes to love. We've located love within ourselves. We viewed it as something maybe we can do, a muscle we can exercise, an emotion we can feel, an experience we can have. The problem is that by locating it in ourselves, we've given it an expiration date because we all die and those we love go away. If love is the thing we all know is necessary like oxygen and beautiful in the way Paul describes it and yet permanent and can be permanent, never end, we need to locate that love outside of us finite beings. We need to locate love outside ourselves. Paul says we see things like in a mirror now that really dim. The mirrors of Paul's age 2,000 years ago were not like our mirrors. You could kind of see yourself in them, but not that clear. They hadn't quite figured out how we can see a mirror today. They were like foggy at best. And Paul says that. I, I know that. I know we see now in a dim mirror. It's something far bigger, far bigger. I hear you I'm reading a quote. It says, I understand you, love says. I know you all the way through. Despite your deepest fears, you absolutely are not nothing. You're highly valuable. Love says, you're worth giving away everything I have. Love says, I would die for you. Do we have anything less than this in the good news that has been reported to us about Jesus Christ? The love outside of ourselves, the love we need to find outside of ourselves, the love every heart is longing for is the permanent, available, eternal, beautiful, always available, never leaving love of Christ that Doris knew. That's what Paul's getting at. He's right. It is impossible for us in some way. We need to look outside of ourselves to true love and see what love has done for us. Not what we can do for love, but what love has done for us. And that love is in Jesus Christ. As the Bible says, God is love. It's his very essence and nature. 
He doesn't love us because we are necessarily lovable in and of ourselves. That's, we all know that's not always the case, is it? He loves us just, just because it's what he is. He is love. He emanates love. He loves his creatures, us. And so that longing you have, that sense of necessity for love, the fact that it's beautiful and yet you know it's not actually going to stay, but you want that permanence, it's pointing to the deeper need in your heart, the greater reality that only Jesus Christ can fill. Greater love has no one than this, the Bible says, that Jesus laid down his life for his friends. But even Paul knows if Jesus did it without love, it was meaningless. But it was full of love. The greatest loving act that's ever been done. And do you know why? Because as the savior of the world, he died an unjust death for the people that actually deserved that death. As the unloving ones. But he loved us. It's God's posture in love. He's patient. He's kind. He endures with us in all our failings. He's hopeful. He's permanent. And he looks at longingly and with beauty towards those who are in Christ. If love is like a basketball game, as we talked earlier, we keep playing because we love the game. In reality, we need to see the playing field, the court, if love is kind of like a game, and realize that the game has actually already been won. The game has been won. Jesus has won the game by defeating those things that do make love imperfect, sin and death. He has won the game. The gospel is the declaration of Jesus Christ that the game is over. The creator of the world has come onto the court and he slam dunked on death and sin. <laughs> Through what looked like a defeat, the death of the cross, came the payment for us the way to make a, a road back to the love that we lost at the beginning of creation, to find the real hope and joy for your heart, it's the victory of the resurrection. This is how we know what love is. And that love never ends. And that love has beaten death. Jesus is love, incarnate, come to earth. The one Doris lived her life for. Find hope in that today. That longing is there in your heart. Find love in Christ today. We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing this song, This World is Not My Home. And even that sense there that this world is wonderful and beautiful, and yet we know something's missing about it, points to a greater, deeper need in your heart. Don't, it, don't ignore that today. If you're sitting here and you're kind of like, I'm not sure about Jesus, but he, this guy's kind of onto something when he says, like, I, I know there's something in my heart that's missing. Don't ignore that. Run towards that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the witness and testimony of Doris's life and the fact that we heard of her love today multiple times, her love for you, her love of life, her love of children and learning and community and friends and service and 60 years here at Bethany Church. I don't know how you do anything for 60 years without a deep love. Being with God's people and worshiping with God's people. Love drove Doris, and we thank you for that. And even in the imperfect expression of her own love, as we all imperfectly express it, Lord, it is you who expressed love flawlessly. And we thank you for that. May we find true love, forgiveness, meaning, and life everlasting so that that love never does end. In you, Jesus, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Would you stand as we sing this song?
Doris is truly home, and I know that uh, image of the door. It was actually mentioned a couple times today. There was the door she went through and saw her loved ones and saw her friends. But I will tell you this, as excited as she would have been to see uh, Darlene and others there, and her family would agree with this, she was more excited to see Jesus. Can you get there in your life? Where you'd be more excited to see Jesus than those loved ones that went before you? I think that kind of love is available in him. Explore that. Pursue it. Don't let that nagging feeling go away. Um, Doris would, if she could, tell you. (laughs) As we head out today, um, I'm going to let the family go first in a minute because if I don't, they'll never get out there. You'll talk with them in here and they'll never get out to have food and see the rest of you out there. Um, So I'm going to say a benediction over us and then the family's going to go down the middle here as Rich opens the door for them back there. And then after they go, uh, these first couple rows here, the rest of you are dismissed. And we want to invite you to stay. Don't leave. Stay and enjoy that love that Doris had with her family, with her friends, with her church, with the community, with Kiwanis and all the education people. I'm just curious, who's here from Kiwanis? Because you know her from Kiwanis. Raise your hand. A few. How about education throughout the years? Hand. Excellent. How about church life? And then all the others, you just know her. There you go. (laughs) Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his face, his countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a wonderful afternoon and, and make sure you say hi to the family and give them a hug. Family, you guys can head on out towards the center and then we'll dismiss the rest. We've got some cookies and punch and water out there. Help yourself.